Hey, this is the last notes video for module three, and we are going to talk about classifying matter. I already got some of my notes on the board, so you guys may have to pause it and write stuff down if you so desire. Actually, not if you so desire. If you're in my class, you have to write it down. Thanks. Okay, classifying matter. Uh, first, elements. Elements, like we've talked about before, can be classified as either metal, if they are to the left of the jagged line on the beloved periodic table, or they are non-metals if they are to the right of the jagged line on the beloved periodic table. Compounds, which we've just been learning about, are classified as either ionic or covalent. So these are some new terms for you. Ionic means that if you dissolve this compound in water, it will conduct electricity. And if you're in my class, we did this lab together uh, just this past week, and so we saw examples of ionic compounds and covalent compounds. The ionic compounds, again, when dissolved in water, conduct electricity. Covalent, you guys are way ahead of me, when dissolved in water, do not conduct electricity. Covalent compounds do not conduct electricity. Okay? So how do we classify compounds? Well, there are two ways. First of all, if you have a compound, you can decide, I feel like doing an experiment today. I think I'm gonna dissolve this compound in water and then see if it will conduct electricity. And that's how I'll know if it's ionic or covalent. Or you may not have time for that. And then you can just look to the beloved periodic table. Here's, here's how to do it. For ionic compounds, they will contain at least one metal atom and one non-metal atom, at least one of each. Okay, so for an ionic compound, you'd have to find which atoms are present in the molecule, find them on the periodic table, and then locate whether they are to the left or the right of the jagged line. If you have one of each, it's ionic. And as you can guess, for a covalent compound, it does not have one of each. It only contains non-metal atoms. So you would find all of the atoms in this red section, or hydrogen, remember hydrogen is an exception. So even though it's over here hanging out on the left, it's colored red, so you know that it's a non-metal because there always have to be exceptions in life, right? All right, so that is how you classify elements or compounds and then compounds as ionic or covalent by looking at the periodic table. Let's do an example. Let's take table sugar. For example, table sugar. Okay? The chemical formula for this compound is C12H22O11. Okay? So you have this compound. How many oxygen atoms, by the way, would be found in one molecule of table sugar? Oh, you guys are good. That's right. 11, if you look at that subscript down there. Okay, but now we're trying to classify and figure out if table sugar is ionic or covalent. If you did the lab with me, you already know. Uh, but you can also just locate where the atoms are on the periodic table. So we have carbon right here in the red. We have hydrogen over here in the red. And we have oxygen over here in the red. So they are all non-metals, making it a covalent compound. These are all non-metals. So, covalent. Move over, flower. You can't see the board. Move over a little more. Thank you. All right, another example. Another uh, item you have in your kitchen. Baking soda. Baking soda's chemical formula is Na for sodium, so just the N is capitalized. Na, capital H, capital C, capital O, capital three. Okay, so if we have one molecule of baking soda, how many hydrogen atoms are there in there? There's no subscript after the H, which means that there's one, because remember, chemists can't be bothered to write the one. Good job. All right, uh, baking soda. So we will look at the periodic table and find where those atoms are. We're looking for sodium, 
hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Sodium is here on the left, making it a metal. And then Smack hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen are all nonmetals. So there's at least one nonmetal and one metal, making it ionic. The sodium is a metal. H, C, and O are all nonmetals. But because at least one of each is present, this is ionic, which means it would conduct electricity. So that's how you classify uh, matter. Now we're going to talk about how to name these different compounds. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> All right, naming ionic compounds. I already wrote my notes out because it helps me save time in these videos. First, naming ionic compounds is easier because when a non-metal atom joins together with a metal atom, boom, only one type of molecule can form every time. They always do it the same way. Uh, so first, we name the first atom. You might be thinking, well, which atom is first? How do I know? When you're asked a question or you're given a problem um, in this class, it'll just tell you which atom comes first, okay? So don't worry about that. Number one, you name the first atom. Number two, you name the second atom, but replace the ending with "-ide", the suffix "-ide". We'll do an example together in just a minute. Third, you put the two names together for the compound name. Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? Let's start with, let's say the problem says, okay, you have this type of an atom and this type of an atom. What is the name of the compound? Okay, well, we start by naming the first atom. And see, this one is the first one given. Na is one of the first 20 elements on the periodic table, so you should have this one memorized. Na is sodium. So this is called sodium, and Cl is chlorine, but this is where we add that suffix, I-D-E. So instead of chlorine, we're going to write chloride for the name of the compound. Sodium chloride. Okay? If you're just talking about chlorine somewhere, Cl is chlorine, but when it's part of a compound like this, uh, we change the last, the last three letters to IDE. All right, so that one is sodium chloride. Here's another example. Uh, K is a chemical symbol, and O. K is a metal, potassium. O is a nonmetal, oxygen. When they join together, they form a compound. What is it called? Well, we said K is potassium. I'm going to write it over here this time. O is oxygen, so the compound name is potassium oxide, potassium oxide, okay? And that's all you have to do. You'll get used to where you um, add that suffix at the end. If you were confused about whether it be oxide or something, you'll kind of get used to the names of these compounds and it'll be more familiar to you. So that's how you name ionic compounds. Okay, now we're gonna talk about naming covalent compounds. So when you're naming a compound, really the very first step is to figure out whether it's ionic or covalent. Remember, ionic is gonna have a nonmetal and a metal. Covalent is just gonna be made of nonmetals. Naming covalent compounds is trickier because two nonmetals can join together sometimes in a number of different ways. Trickier because two nonmetals can join to form different molecules. Take carbon and oxygen, for example. We've talked about this example before. Carbon and oxygen can join together in this way to make carbon dioxide, or it can join together with one carbon and one oxygen to make carbon monoxide. Very different, a poisonous gas. Okay, so once you have decided whether, that it is a covalent compound, next you need to name it and you have to follow a few different steps. Number one, begin with 
the ionic compound rules. Begin with ionic, actually I'm going to say ionic naming rules. So what I mean is that you first just name, you name the first atom, and then you name the second atom. The second atom has that I, D, E on the end. So those are the same as ionic rules. But secondly, you need prefixes to show how many of each atom. You need prefixes. We've talked about the suffix, the suffix I, D, E. A suffix comes at the end of a word. A prefix comes at the beginning. You didn't know you were going to get some English lessons in here too, did you? Need prefixes to show how many atoms um, of each type are in the molecule, okay? So if you look at table <clears throat> 3.1, you need to make sure you are familiarized with it. In fact, you need to memorize the prefixes. Sorry about that, but you're actually probably going to know a majority of them already. So memorize table 3.1, so you know those prefixes, okay? And after you add the correct prefixes, number three, you drop the prefix mono, which means one, drop the mono for the first atom, okay? That probably doesn't make a lot of sense until we do a couple examples. So let's do an example. Uh, we're going to try these examples right up here, which you already know the names for, but now we're going to go through step by step so you can see how we got the names for them. Okay? First of all, C-O. Start by naming the first atom. This is carbon. This is oxygen. Okay? Uh, you need prefixes to show how many atoms of each. How many atoms of carbon are there in one of these molecules? Well, there is no subscript down here because chemists can't be bothered to write the one. So it means there's one carbon. So one, the prefix for one is mono. So it'd be monocarbon, except that we know the third rule is to drop the mono for the first atom. So actually... We don't include the mono there. So the first atom is just represented by saying carbon. The second one, oxygen, we change to oxide. And how many oxygen atoms are there? That is correct. There is also only one oxygen atom in this molecule. So this is called carbon monoxide. I should have written that a little bit differently with a little bit more space there, but oh well, you get the picture. So you have to add in the prefix before to show that we are talking about the carbon and oxygen model uh, molecule with only one carbon and one oxygen. Not to be confused with CO2. Okay? In this example, again, we would have monocarbon because there's one carbon, but we don't write the mono for the first atom. So this is called carbon. And now because there are two oxygens, the prefix for two is di, so carbon dioxide. And then we can see the differences between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So it's very important to be able to name those two compounds differently because you don't want to walk into a room that says, Stop! This room contains carbon monoxide. But if you saw a sign that said, Enter! This room contains carbon dioxide. You wouldn't have a problem. So that is how you name covalent compounds. Remember, the first step when naming a compound is just to figure out, is it ionic? Okay, follow these rules. Or is it covalent? Okay, follow these rules. That's it. That's module three. Good work. No, this is Potter. Crusty Crab. Ugh. I am not a crusty crab. <laughs>